song. If you'd like to make mark the invitation song, that'll be 361. 361 is the invitation song. And the song we're going to sing next is 287. Invade in high and holy lay, my soul, her grateful voice would raise. For who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. So in our efforts to lead people to Christ, we know and we understand that the importance, um, the, the Word of God is um, very, very powerful. Um, indeed, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells us, so uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We know that faith comes when people hear God's Word. And our scripture reading this evening, Romans 1 and verse 16, that the power of God is in his word. Let's look at that again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said that. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, uh, we are to be imitators of Christ. We too, in other words, should not be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or to the Gentile, anyone else who is not a Jew, which that is us. We are Gentiles because we're not Jews. There were only two classes of people. There were either Jews or there were Gentiles. And so we are Gentiles, and the gospel is powerful, and it leads to salvation. But we have a responsibility as Christians to the gospel and to teaching the gospel and we can teach people the gospel not only through the word but through our lives through our actions and we are commanded to do so people can see the truth in the gospel in action through our lives and there are certain things that we are supposed to do and that's what we're going to look at this evening is how can people see the truth of the gospel in action 
in our lives? And how can we demonstrate that? And so there are certain signposts, so to speak, that can guide people to the truth, not only in what we say through teaching the gospel, but how we live our lives. And there, God, who loves them, the people, the non-believer, can find Jesus manifested in his love. And the one who is a true searcher is going to find true disciples of Christ, and they can be led to Christ from those signposts. So the first one that we'll look at is the signpost of unity. The value of unity for believers, we can find this. Let's look at John chapter 17. If you would turn there, John chapter 17. And Jesus here is talking to his disciples in verse 20. And he tells them the importance of being united. John chapter 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me. Sorry, this is his prayer to, uh, to God. I got ahead of myself on my verses. Uh, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. They that all that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect or complete in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. So here Jesus is praying for unity, not just for his disciples, but for any and all believers who come after his disciples, and that is the church. God and Christ want unity, and he shows that God sent Christ, and it shows that God has loved the world when we have unity in God. So unity is a signpost to the world. It's not just for us as Christians, but it's a signpost to the world. John 3.16, most of us can quote it, But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should not perish. God loves the world. He loved the world so much that he was willing to, to send his only begotten son. We talked about that in class this morning and how we can't truly understand what that's like. Maybe we have lost a child or we may lose a child or a grandchild, but we will not ever truly understand what it's like to have to sacrifice a child like God had to do. And it is his only begotten child. Jesus was born and born of God, from God. Let's look now at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He's speaking about the division between Jews and Gentiles. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in our ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Here we see that God sent Christ who produces the unity witnessed by the world. In the Old Testament, we know that the Jews were God's chosen people. They spiritually cheated on God in their marriage with God. And so God divorced the Jews and had to find a new bride. And that new bride was the church. And God understands what it's like to lose a bride to spiritual infidelity. And he doesn't want to lose us, but he wants to maintain unity with
within the church so that he doesn't have that separation and that division again like he had with the Jews. And when Jesus came, there was no longer this division between the Jews and the Gentiles, this hatred, but rather he brought unity between that family. And so now there is oneness between God's people through obedience. So the importance of unity here, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul tells the Corinthians there, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly or completely joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. See, several times Paul talks about the church being a body. If we talk about a body, or the church being a body, think about that, being, that body being divided in a literal form. We're talking about cutting up a body. God wants us to be perfectly joined together and not separated in any way, but the body working together. And if we're separated or divided, hands can't work together, feet can't work together, nothing is going to function properly if we're not unit, united together. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says this, again, Paul speaking. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, call them out, and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So not only mark them, but avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own pleasures, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So when people try to split up this unity that God has set up, they try to deceive others with their words. And that's not what God wants. The importance of unity, again, Paul teaches in attitude as well. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're not going to read all of this chapter, but most of this chapter talks about unity. And most of this, most of this we know. But Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in, bond, in the bond of peace. This is the attitude that Paul wants towards unity. He wants lowliness or the meekness that he says here in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity. Of peace. This is, should be our attitude, attitude towards unity. But what is that unity? Verses 4 through 6. There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then if you would turn to Philippians chapter 2, and he tells us a little bit more about this attitude that we should have. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. If, therefore, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any vows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love with one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness and of mind, let each esteem other better than him themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now verse 4, he's not telling us to be busybodies, but he's telling us to help each other when we need it. There's a difference because there's another passage where he tells us not to be busybodies. And that's the qualification of elder women too, is to not be busybodies. So uh, we know the difference there. So let's be sure that we do nothing to destroy the signposts of unity. Rather, let's work toward enhancing its effectiveness. Another signpost that points one in the right direction is the signpost of love. And here, John chapter 13, verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. He's speaking to his disciples here. This is where I got it out of myself earlier. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Here it shows that we have been loved by Christ, 
whose love we seek to emulate or to copy. And then verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love, have loved one to another. See, when the world sees us loving each other as Christians like Christ loved us, then the world knows that we are Christ's disciples, that we follow after him and his teachings. It shows that we are his true disciples. So love truly is a signpost to the world, and they can come to Christ because of that. Let's turn now to John chapter 15, if you would. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. Jesus says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And notice the stipulation here, verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So when we obey God, we are recognized by Jesus as his friends. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, that is agape love, the kind of love that God has for everyone, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So that those who emulate his love are again his true disciples. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 and 10, again, show us the importance of love. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So Paul here is telling them, you already know brotherly love, and you do it well, but keep doing it. Colossians 3 verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity, or again, love, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. And so Paul considers, when he considers love, he considers the bond of perfectness. Here we see that love and unity do go together. By our love for one another, we are more likely to preserve our unity in Christ, and the world sees this. Unity and love go hand in hand as a divine signpost. So the first, uh, the first unity lets people know that God loves them, and the second shows people who are the followers of Christ. So the third signpost is hope. The value of hope, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh, you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So hope can prompt people to ask us questions about our hope. It can provide an, us an opportunity to share the reason for our hope and give us that opportunity to teach people about Christ. So again, hope is a signpost to the world. Presuming that our hope is something noticeable to the world and based upon reason or evidence of faith. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, if you would. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So our hope must be accompanied by peace and joy. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So we should be steadfast even in tribulation or trials. And then verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts with the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. 
So our hope should be based upon the love of God, which we've already talked about. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4 said, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our love, Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So our hope is made sure by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter, to let Peter to command Christians to set their hope fully on the grace to come. The final signpost is good works. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We know that when we do good works, it's not our light that shines, but God's light that shines because we must be humble and know that it is God that allows us to do these good and glorious things. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12 Having your conversation or manner of life honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Again, they have to see our good works in order for our good works to do any good. So good works are a signpost to the world directing people to consider the motivation behind good works. Let's look at um, 1 Peter Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is an example of Christians whose lives can be an example. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, ye, likewise, ye wives... Be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or manner of life of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So the world or people outside can see the good lives, the good works of the Christian wives and might be won over or convinced by the good works of the wives can open people up to the gospel message and inspire them to be obedient. Titus chapter 3 verse 1 says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. In Titus chapter 3 verses 8, verse 8 and verse 14, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Verse 14 of Titus 3. And let ours also lead to learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. So we not only do good works just once in a while, but we maintain our good works. So these are the signposts that accompany our teachings so that people can see our good works, that we show unity, that we love each other, and that we show good works with our lives and with our teaching. Yes, God's word is going to lead people by faith, and it has the power and the salvation, but we are also commanded to do these things. As well, and some people, like we talked about in class this morning, need to see to believe, and so our actions can help along with the teaching. If there are any this morning, this evening, that would like to respond to the Lord's invitation, you have that opportunity.
Five will be the song before the closing prayer. Three eighty five. No fears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears of fear, sorrow.